Welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar on leading through disrupted times. I'm Joe Nagel from the Innovation Beehive and very shortly I'll be handing over to Moth, the founder of the Innovation Beehive. Um, but before I do, I would like to thank the Marches Growth Hub for uh, partnering with us to deliver this webinar today. Uh, the Marches Growth Hub are based in Shropshire and they offer business support uh, to small medium enterprises um, so if you're a sole trader, if you're an entrepreneur, um, or if you're a growing business, do reach out to them if you're based in Shropshire. And also more broadly, if you're joining us from across the UK, look out for local business support in your area. I'm sure you've all seen that the government is giving a lot of support to businesses at the moment. It's there to be used, it's there to support us, and it's there to help us through these disrupted times. And uh, Anna from the Shropshire Growth Hub, uh, from the Marches Growth Hub, will be reaching out to you after this webinar for some feedback uh, and also to share a little bit more about what they do. So um, welcome to the webinar and I'll hand straight over to Mark. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, reiterating our thanks to the Marches Growth Hub and welcome to our webinar. So um, I'm Mark. I'm the founder of the Innovation Beehive, a small business based in Gloucestershire, uh, founded uh, just over 11 years ago now. Um, and throughout those 11 years, we've had the real pleasure of working with a number of organizations, whether it's smaller organizations or large organizations such as McDonald's uh, and Google. Uh, we've been helping them accelerate the potential of their people, of their brands and of their team for just over 11 years now. Um, and actually, when this pandemic first struck, I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, innovation, agility, adaptability. No one's going to want to buy that sort of stuff at the moment. They're all focusing just on operating on business as normal. And actually, as we found over the last few months, more and more of our clients or new clients are coming to us and saying, we're having to adapt, we're having to be more agile, we're having to be more innovative on a day-to-day -day basis because each one of us, whether we are the CEO or whether we're a small business owner, or whether we're a frontline employee, all of us are encountering new problems and new challenges as we live in these disrupted times. And we all need the toolkit that the innovators have and we're drawing upon it. Because when we normally talk about disruption at the Innovation Beehive in a pre-COVID-19 world, uh, what we've heard then and what we've talked about then is um, the classic definition of disruption, which was uh, in the Innovators' Dilemma by the late Clayton Christensen. He talked about disruption then in terms of AI or in terms of changing markets or in terms of what startups are doing. But we're now experiencing disrupted times in what we call a small D rather than a capital D. Our economies are disrupted, our streets are disrupted, our ways of communicating are disrupted, and the messages that we're receiving are disrupted as well. All of us are leading in incredibly disrupted and turbulent times. I'm going to try and use, I'm not use the word unprecedented, because I think that's being used so much at the moment. And, um, you know, as Mark said, we're living through incredibly disruptive times. And um, we're curious to know, um, from those of you who are on the, uh, on the webinar today, what is the biggest disruption with a small d that is going on for you at the moment? So we've just launched a poll. We've got a few options there. Um, I think you could choose one. Uh, and if there are others that you have noticed that are affecting your, your business, do find the chat function and uh, let us know what they are. And I can see some responses coming in already. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, yeah, we've, I mean, we've picked these, um, these options here from what we've seen in the market and in the economy over the last few weeks. And experiences and of experience small business ourselves. owners as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We've experienced a number of these and talked to clients um, and other small businesses and large organizations, multinational organizations. So we're, we truly are all experiencing these, but it'll be interesting to see uh, from the people on the webinar yeah. what's the, what they're experiencing the most. And one, one, of the, one of the good things to know, from, particularly from attending webinars like this, actually, and from, from our role, you know, working with lots of different organizations, is knowing that none of us are alone in the disruptions that we're facing. So um, I'll just, uh, I think just about everyone has completed the poll, which is great. So I will end the poll and share the results. So we can see uh, loss of revenue is very significant. And um, I wonder if the fact that you could only select one um, means that loss of revenue and cash flow could maybe go hand in hand mm -hmm. a little way there. I imagine that's an issue for some people. Um, connecting with teams remotely is, is still an issue for people. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think there was a steep learning curve for us at the start of lockdown for all of us, even, even organizations like us that are kind of doing a lot of 
virtual delivery before. It was such a such an extreme shift to not be having any face to face contact with people, um, and that felt like quite quite a big change. Um, and connecting with customers, uh, I think you know again the remote working issue is is affecting there. But also, I mean, I'd be interested to know if anyone has any thoughts on the customer side in the chat. Um, is uh, how, to what extent you know the customers are there at the moment. You know, we as as you can imagine, when 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 the economy goes the way it has, uh, you know, a HR innovation consultancy mm. like us has seen um, certainly a decline in, in live well, projects. A decline in revenue and to live yeah. and live in, in projects. But actually, I would say that there are still lots of customers that we're talking to. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of customers that we're offering advice to, and we're viewing it very much as saying, let's rethink uh, what success means at the moment. Success in the past would have been winning a project and delivering a great piece of work for a client. Success now is about standing alongside a client. It's about interacting with the client. It's about knowing that we're deepening our relationships. So when they move into a post COVID-19 world, they've got us in their line of sight and in their mind for when they do have money, they're able to spend and put yeah. against budgets again. Absolutely. And, and actually those of you who joined the webinar last week, and I'll be sure to put a, a, a link to the YouTube mm. video of the webinar in the email after this. Um, one of the things that we were talking about was how you can use this, the tools and the behaviors and skills of virtual delivery to connect with customers and to be there for customers. And, you know, one of the values of the innovation behavior is we love, love, love our customers and our clients. And that, that's really, you know, this is when you can live that. Um, and I, I see a couple of comments coming through from Heather. So, uh, we've probably got three of these in equal measure, homework in revenue and connecting with customer. Um, absolutely. Our customers are mainly older people and we don't know yet if they will have the confidence mm -hmm. to come back out into society. We may have to completely rethink some services. Absolutely. Heather, I th am I right in thinking you're in the third sector? Um, so your, your revenue issues are probably um, slightly different from 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 commercial but but I may be wrong maybe, maybe you're experiencing the same challenges I I'm from a um, fundraising background and um, I can imagine that at the moment fundraising is particularly challenging um, but yeah it'd be great to hear from you if you've got any views on that because I you may not be the only uh, third sector um, person on the call today it's interesting. And apologies if I've forgotten if I've misremembered <laughs> it's interesting that whole piece around having to rethink your services for uh, an elder an older or maybe more vulnerable part of society I noticed that Facebook have been promoting portal before post COVID-19 in one particular way and then I spotted over the last couple of days they started having grandparents talking about with portal I'm able to connect in with my grandchildren. I'm able to, it moves around the room. So I'm able to watch my granddaughter take her first steps. They are absolutely repositioning their product portfolio to a broader audience, particularly thinking of, of, a, of a new market sector there. And I can see Heather's come back. Yeah, um, so Heather's in uh, from Age UK and said we've lost fundraising and shop income plus we charge for services too. So the shop income I think is, is, is going to be really a, a significant challenge and um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities from an innovation perspective to kind of think of, rethink the way retail is done and make retail into more of an experience and, and I wonder if there's potentially some creativity um, that you could apply. And we're actually doing a creativity webinar on the 2nd of June, so do come along to that, um, to think about how you can create a, almost a destination for the shops, um, so that as people come out of uh, lockdown and start, we start to renew our economy and renew our ways of engaging with the high street, you know, age UK shops become a place to go so that people you know, feel, feel engaged with the, with, the, with the brand, as it were. Um, but yeah, Mark, over Super, to you. Thank lovely. you, Heather, thanks, thanks for sharing. For that. So um, over the last <clears throat> few months, the challenge has been either as a leader or as a business owner, there are so many new pieces of information and so much continually keeps to change that what do you do uh, when no one knows what to do? That's been the challenge. And you've, you know, we've seen people who have been completely frozen. We've seen people who've completely pivoted and thrown everything up online and then found out actually they're not able to sell their products online. With some people do a mixture of the both. But what do you do when ultimately no one knows what to do? So um, in the 18 months before COVID-19 pandemic, we were interviewing leaders across the world um, about disruption, about how they have led in disrupted times. We talked to them about the last great financial crash 
We talked to him about the impact of AI and machines and market disruptions and new business models that were coming online. And they told us about five different practices that they were leading with that helped them deal with turbulence and to help them navigate through when they didn't actually know what to do. And then again, when we went into this crisis, I thought, gosh, we've done all this research, all this work, we published a white paper on leading in disrupted times. What a waste of money and time that was. And actually reflecting upon it and looking at the information and the data and the research we have, we find that this is now more relevant than ever. These five practices will help you navigate a way through when you don't know what to do. The first practice we heard from leaders is what they call leading in head. And this is about putting your business basics in place. This is about the financial modeling of the business. This is about understanding your customer's expectation. This is about cash flow. This is absolute day-to-day -day business management. And so many of us have been forced to focus very heavily on head on a weekly or daily basis to keep the wheels of our, of our bus going. Secondly, leaders talk to us about leading in heart. And this is about making a connection into the higher purpose of the organization, understanding what you're trying to achieve in the long run, which actually does help people navigate and find a way through some of the complexities and turbulence of the short term. It's also about understanding what motivates yourself and motivates your team members and making sure that you give them workflows and, and working patterns that enables them to stay motivated and keep delivering work for you. Alongside that and sitting very close to it is what leaders talked about leading in health. So over 72% of, of senior leaders that we spoke to said that they had some sort of practice that helped them stay healthy, whether that was running, whether that was meditation, whether it was doing yoga, whether it was just a moment of mindfulness. They had a particular health practice that they did on a daily or a weekly basis that made sure they led in health. They, as we say in those health and safety announcements on airplanes, they put their own oxygen mask on first, before they put the oxygen mask on or helped others. Now, there's a lot more consciousness of that, I think, actually, during the pandemic. You know, we're currently sitting here in Mental Health Awareness Week. There's a lot more open discussion about people's health, about understanding the importance of self-care, particularly as we're all working remotely, most of us are working from home, and that terrible pressure to be on 24 seven, to know there's a bank holiday Monday coming up and saying, am I gonna feel guilty when I actually take a scheduled bank holiday off? Or can I take some time scheduled holiday out when I'm you know, not working in the business as much? The answer is yes. You have to look after your health to make sure you can carry on with the business when we start to ramp up the economy again, when we return and we move into renew, so you're able to take advantage of the opportunities because you'll be resilient and energized. And the fourth leading habit, is, uh, fourth leading practice is, is leading in habit. And this actually can really zap your energy. It's about making sure that you flex to respond to the new data sets that you'll be receiving constantly throughout COVID-19. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on and give you some practice that might help you do that. But knowing you might take a position on something on a Monday morning based on the best set of data, and by Monday afternoon, your, the data will have changed and you'll have to change your direction. You will have either given instructions to team members or to suppliers or to customers that will then need to change a couple of hours later. This flexibility of leading in habit has been a core skill required to lead through the disrupted times of COVID-19 as new information and new data sets constantly emerge. And all of these four practices, leading in head in the business, leading in heart about motivation and connection to purpose, leading in health about self-care, taking care of the wellness of your people so they can take care of your customers, and having the flexibility to lead in habit. All of these add up to how you lead in history. They impact on your leadership legacy, the way you behave now with your customers, your suppliers and your employees will absolutely impact how you are held by them and how much investment they have in their trust bank with you for when you move into a post COVID-19 world and you need them to come back online. So I'm just interested actually in the chat function, thinking about those five practices, 
which one or two of those practices, or maybe more, do you think you've drawn more heavily upon over the times in COVID-19? Have you had to lead more in head in, or in habit? Have you, have you really focused in on leading in health and said, that's what I'm gonna make sure I'm taking care of myself and my people at the moment? Which one of those five practices do you believe that you've led more strongly with during COVID-19? We'd love to see your comments in the chat and which one of those five practices that you have led with. So for me, habit is the big one. I've been, um, I've been very conscious that uh, with, with, with not leaving the house very much, I really need to make a habit of sort of going to sleep at the mm -hmm. right time at a sensible time and getting up at a sensible time. And also eating properly, and not just not overeating, not undereating. Um, so so that's been, well. yeah, 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 making a habit of health in a way. Yeah, and I can see Peter. Uh, Peter has come in and said, "Heart." Um, feel free to expand on that. What have you been drawing on? And and talked about health. Um, be good to know some of the some of the either the practices you've been adopting, or the reason that you've had to draw on that, or the challenges that you've had. Um, how about you, I, I, well, I think I started off in head and definitely in my head, as I said, mm. you know, as a small business owner, I thought, right, this is after 11 years of work, my business is going to collapse and disappear mm. over the line. You know, nine employees based in the Great Hub in Sirencester. I was quite proud of the business we had. So I was working in head quite a lot and I actually became quite overwhelmed in the second week and had to catch myself in health. I had to take some time out. I took some time out of the business. I started running again. I started making sure that I run three times a week, got an old bicycle out of the garage and started cycling at least once a week as well. Because I can't lead in head unless I was healthy enough to do it. So I'd say those are the two that I really had to focus on most strongly. Yeah, This is interesting. Heather has said that um, she's been leading in heart, motivating staff and assuring trustees and getting strong messages out for the older people who are the stakeholders. And then the, my director of ops has led on head, the facts, the figures, and the shape. And that's a, really, that's a really powerful point, actually, that when you're a leader in an organization with a team, and I'm conscious not all of us are, uh, you know, we'll have, some people will be entrepreneurs on this call, but if you have people around you who can take the, the, the element of leadership that you're perhaps less strong at, then um, that, that, that can be really helpful. Um, and Nicola has said that since returning from furlough, definitely head, um, uh, but coinciding with heart as staff are feeling vulnerable. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, and actually, a lot of uh, when we talk to a lot of leaders about this, they talk about head and heart on a sort of continuum or a mm. spectrum. And it's about finding the right place on that spectrum to, to operate in for the particular circumstance or situation that you're in. Um, Carol has said a mix of core habit and scope to flex as the situation develops and change direction but underpinned by heart as the situation pans out. I like that. I like the idea that your habits can flex. That's a mm. really good point. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later when Moksha is a really useful tool for decision making. Um, uh, Teresa has uh, said health was number one, making sure staff and volunteers and clients stay safe. Now we're led by heart and habit and think about how we can deliver services in this new world. Absolutely. And um, we've just launched, a, we've just released a, a white paper about the return phase of the roadmap, which Mox is about to talk about, stealing your thunder there. Um, but one of the key priorities in return is safety. Um, but another key priority is well-being. Um, and we really felt it was important to call out those two things separately because you can easily get into a situation where you make people feel um, uncomfortable or stressed by the safety precautions that you're putting in place so it's about balancing those and making sure that you factor in both um, so we were doing some work with a, a well-known retailer that's about to open and they were looking at how they make sure their staff don't interact with each other how they keep social distancing uh, and how they protect people and there were lots and lots of posters going up all over the wall saying stop think wait don't go here lots of hands and actually from an employee's experience it was it put your blood pressure up and you actually became very scared and very very alert to all of these unsafe practices so a little bit around heart and thinking mm -hmm. about how the experience is a little bit kinder in our communications can really help bring people with you and not over frighten them so if you just focus on the safety and forget the well-being you can actually tip them out of well-being 
And Anne has said that um, she's been walking in nature, meditating, mm. healthy eating, thinking of ways to connect with and provide resources to colleagues. I agree that other colleagues work in more from head perspective. All are important. And Carol has said loving the birds in the background. Yes, it's a quirk of living in the countryside and having an open chimney, but at least we're bringing some of nature into the yeah, webinar. I love, it. I love <laughs> it. You're not the only person to comment on that, actually. I was on a, on a conference call with the States the other day, and they were talking about the bird song in my dining room. It was hilarious. <laughs> All the way in Chicago. And it's just one other, one other comment has come through from Peter, um, and she said that uh, she's been focusing on head, um, and the purpose of the organisation, uh, sorry, he said he was focused on heart, right? So the purpose of the organisation is to support the construction industry with ensuring biodiversity. So there's a really clear purpose mm -hmm. there. Um, and they've, they've stayed, clear, stayed true to their ethos of the company and have not stopped working, but some clients have left and they haven't been able to attend sites quickly enough. So there's some challenges logistically and operationally because of the current situation, but you're keeping the purpose at the core of what you do. And that's, that's a very important aspect of heart, isn't it, Mark? Cool. Yeah. So the Thanks challenge everyone. is that um, we as leaders are having to lead in uh, what Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, called uh, the Stockdale Paradox. Uh, so James Stockdale was a prisoner in a Vietnam War prisoner of war camp. Uh, and he later went on when he was freed, released and returned to the United States uh, to stand actually for nomination as a vice president candidate in the United States. Now he lived through some terrible experiences in the Vietnam War and he was asked for advice for people who were living through very difficult and challenging times and he said basically you have to have faith, this is how he survived, you have to have faith that you'll prevail in the end regardless of the difficulties and at the same time you must confront the most brutal facts of your current reality whatever that might be. And that duality of leadership has really been a central part in the COVID-19 paradox. How do leaders hold the reality of what is happening now and inspire people and help them believe and think to the future of a post-COVID-19 world? To be able to navigate the COVID-19 paradox, we have identified that there are some key questions and some key skills that will be required. But again, looking back at major world events and major events that have impacted upon the economy and speaking to our clients about disruption with both a capital and a small d, we were able to put together and codify a roadmap through uncertainty. We identified four key stages that we will go through during this pandemic. And it's helpful to think about the different questions and the different skills and behaviours that you'll need at each of these stages. Stage one, which we have probably all gone through, is about stabilise the business, understand what's happening now. Stage two is sustain. Many of us will be in that stage at the moment, which is how do we keep working through this stage? Stage three is about return. This is a planning to return and then returning to work in the new normal or the next normal because normal will not be a uh, stick, it will be transient, it will change continuously. Before future face in the organisation into the new, setting new objectives, new goals and exploiting new opportunities. Now I'm interested to try and understand, thinking of those four stages before we go into them in detail, just from what you heard now, are you in the stabilised phase? Are you in the sustained phase? Are you in the return phase? Or have you come back and are looking to the future with new goals and objectives? Are you in the renew phase? So you should see one of Joe's fantastic polls coming up on the screen. What stage do you find yourself in now? We'll give you a couple of minutes to fill it in. And it, we might well all be at different stages and that's okay. We may be at different stages at different days in the week, yeah. but generally, what stage I mean, do you I think, think that, that's what you just said then speaks into that point you made about the next normal. Mm. Uh, I find that an absolutely fascinating point that actually, you know, we can feel that things have taken four or five steps forward, but then something will happen that might throw us sideways or throw us back mm. and we have to adapt and adjust again. And I think with things like continual government guidance being updated, the fact that we're all going to, at the end of this month, understand the new implications of people coming back part-time for the furlough scheme. We might think we're in return and then suddenly we have to get back into sustain or stabilise. Can I actually afford to take on this? So you're right, Joe. it will change mm -hmm. continuously. Here we go. So I think just about everyone has completed the poll. So let's see the results. Here we go. 
Wow. So um, I think this is a very timely webinar for people because um, the stabilized phase uh, is this, some, some, some people are still in the stabilized phase. And, um, you know, that is understandable depending on the industries and the sectors. And of course, we're speaking to right across industry on this webinar today. Um, and it would be, be interesting if, you, if you're happy to share what, why you still feel you're in the stabilized zone. Um, you know, what's going on? Is your, is your industry particularly affected? Uh, the vast majority of us are in sustain, um, which means that we're in an we've got an opportunity to prepare to have a brilliant return. Um, and actually, I think it might be wise to send the white paper that you've recently just written That's on return. Um, so we, what we've done is, um, as well as the white paper that Mark talked about uh, on leadership, we've also created a white paper on this roadmap. And actually, then we created one that focuses in on returns. So um, I'll send that out to everyone after this webinar. Right. I think it'll be really useful because actually, being in return means that um, you, 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 whatever you learn today, you're going to need to adapt into what you're doing already. Majority of us in sustain means that we're we're able to prepare for the next phase, which is great. And then someone's in renew, and that's great. And as Mark mentioned about the next normal, be prepared to take steps sideways, take take steps back, but maybe take leaps and bounds forward as well. Brilliant. And I think actually what's interesting is these aren't linear mm -hmm. and they're not time bound. So, it, you know, uh, sustain could be over 12 weeks, uh, renew could be over a month, it could be over three months, it could be over the next six months. We don't know. And each industry and each organisation will experience it differently. And, and uh, a really nice point has come through on the chat that um, the return phase, we may be in the return phase, but it's going to be a slow, steady one. And not quick. Absolutely. And you've talked about this being a marathon mentality. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so let's go through each of those stages. I might, I might move over stabilize a little bit quicker, uh, but if we move to the next slide. Then. So stabilize, uh, there were some key questions uh, that we're either answering if we're still in stabilize or we had to answer before we could move through. I mean, you know, COVID-19 came at us very slowly and then incredibly quickly. It was almost like watching a train in the distance, then suddenly it speeded up. And I'm certainly talking to our clients and experiencing it as businesses that run, you know, we run our own business. Um, there were questions we had to answer, which are, what is actually happening? What is going on with our customers? What's going on with the economy? What's going on with the world? Um, and how do, if we can, how do we continue to operate our business while this is happening? Now, the skills and behaviours that needed to be pulled upon to ensure that you're able to stabilise the ship and make sure that something was still able to operate was process management, real head thinking stuff when you think about the five practices, getting in your head, understanding the processes, what was going on. As we all started to have to work from home, IT solutions for either collaboration or for communication. Looking at financial modelling, where were we spending our money, where could we cut costs, what's our run rate, what does our cash flow look like. Um, and I think this has really been the time of HR has really stepped into this void and supported organisations. Um, the HR business leader around helping with furloughing, helping with culture, helping, um, helping build wellness opportunities into the organisation. But there were lots of HR and legal regulations that we all suddenly had to get up to speed with. I was worth saying that if, if, if any of the points that Mark just made you didn't address when you were in the stabilized phase, it's probably worth looking back and just checking that you've optimized in, the, in those regards. So, you know, in, th in terms of process and IT um, and HR issues. And I can see that a comment came through um, that actually um, the person who clicked stabilize meant to click sustain rather than stabilize. So, so nobody on this webinar okay. is currently. Well, then let's move on. Mode. Let's <laughs> move on then into sustain, which is where a lot of people are at the moment. Um, and in sustained phase, uh, there are so sort of three top, you all have different questions, but there are three collective questions that we're hearing time again from business owners and from CEOs or senior leaders. One, how do we keep working through this? That's physically, how do we you know, actually keep shipping our products, services and delivering some sort of service to our clients? And how do we keep working together and collaborating together and communicating as we work through this? Secondly, what new problem solving skills do my people need? As I said, more and more of us now are coming up with new challenges or coming up against new challenges 
new problems and hopefully new opportunities on a weekly or daily basis. And we've had to be inventive. We've had to draw upon the skills of the innovator so that leaders, have had to, leaders and business owners have had to ask themselves, how do I get those problem solving skills? What do my people need to be able to overcome challenges when I'm not sitting beside them? When we can't just go off into a small breakout room, have an idea generation session or a brainstorm and then come back. Or when I'm so busy leading in head and doing cash flow and having to manage some of the detail that I don't normally have to manage because some of my team are furloughed, people are have to be empowered and coming up with decisions on their own and making their own calls on judgment on, on issues that maybe leaders may have been more involved in in the past. And then thirdly, in the sustained phase, you can't freeze and stay still. How do we continue to explore new opportunities? So <clears throat> it is my personal belief that in 2021, there will be a large number of startups that have been born out of this crisis, have spotted an opportunity and moved into that space and have been able to build a business as a result of it. My own business was founded in the last financial crash when I lost my job and lost my home. And I said, right, there's no work out there. I'm gonna make work for myself and now I make work for a number of people and help people in their own employment have better uh, employee experiences and deliver better customer experiences. So what opportunities might there be out there from a personal experience, we've, we've looked at the past around delivering online training and delivering some of our creativity courses and some of our leadership courses online. We've almost always kind of steered away from it. We've played gently in that space when a client has wanted it as part of an add-on. But we believe there's a real opportunity because expectations of our customers and the market has changed. So now we are focusing and investing heavily in the new opportunity of online training. So that's changed our business model, I think, forever and for good. So the sorts of skills and behaviours that we'll be looking to demonstrate at this time is one, what, what um, Joe referred to earlier on, that marathon mentality. This isn't going to be over in a couple of weeks. We now know that now. As we move out of lockdown in a number of countries and in the United Kingdom, you know, we may find ourselves actually moving back into it at some point into the future. This isn't going to be a 10-day oppression. This is going to go on for months and possibly years. So how do you sustain your energy? How do you think of it as a marathon as opposed to exhausting yourself putting everything out in the first couple of months and then having nothing new come out afterwards you'll need to learn the innovation skills and creative problem solving skills because as you plan to return as you work through all the issues and sustain and even as you start to spot new opportunities and capitalize them in your organization you're going to have a number of barriers and unknown unknowns that will come up to, for you to have to solve so how do you effectively come up with a solution knowing that you have to be more agile and adaptable because the solutions that you might have in place before COVID-19 may not be available to you. As I said, you may not simply be able to go and brainstorm or purchase something. There may not be the cash to go and purchase that particular app or that particular freelancer or that particular vendor's work. How do you come up with it and do it yourself? Within that, you won't get it right the first time. As we try and solve all of the new unknown challenges that come up against us, we won't get it right 100% of the time. We'll mess up slightly. So again, taking the skill set of the innovator, being able to prototype something quite scrappy, put it out there, iterate and change as you get feedback or as your customers respond to it, will allow you to keep adapting and live that practice of leading in habit. And finally, a real skill we've all been developing is making sure that we stay connected as a team, whether it's virtual coffee mornings, whether it's check-ins, using technology, whether it's WhatsApp or online tools, making sure that we stay connected as a team and that we keep a handle on our resilience, thinking back to the habit of leading in health, making it okay to not be okay, really listening out as a leader when you ask people, how are you doing? And they say, yeah, fine just seeing the value of really checking in and making sure that when you hear, yes, I'm fine, that somebody really is fine. Now, the challenge around sustain is that you will be coming up against unknown unknowns continuously. New challenges, new opportunities that you could have never anticipated in a pre-COVID-19 world. How do you go about making a decision as a leader and also knowing that new data sets, new unknowns and new information is continually emerging. How do you manage it if that decision you make 
will then need to change or be pivoted a matter of hours or days later. So I want to share with you um, a piece of stimulus. It's called the OODA loop. Now the OODA loop was, um, was coined by the dog fighters in World War II. Statistically, those dog fighters who practiced the OODA loop were more likely to return from battle. And there are four stages to it, and we can learn from those dog fighters as leaders and put these four stages into practice as we're trying to make decisions. So when you're trying to make a decision, observe the data that you have in front of you. Ask yourself, is this the most data, valid data? And what has changed since the last time you reviewed this data? Really observe it. Orientate yourself. What do you summarize is happening as a result of the data that's currently available to you? And importantly, are you aware of any unconscious bias that could be impacting your interpretation of the data? Once you have a consciousness of any potential unconscious bias, you're able to put it aside or at least observe it and make sure it doesn't impact on your orientation and your understanding of the data in front of you. Only then can you move on to the third stage in the OODA loop, which is decide, which is creating a response based on a non-biased view of the best data available. Then moving into act, where you implement your decision. You'll then uh, share your decision with your team, your customers, or your suppliers. Now, I would advise leaders to be very transparent about the OODA loop. Use it in front of your people. Talk about the four stages that you will go through, knowing that as new information and new data sets emerge, you'll have to start again at the beginning of the loop, observing that new piece of data, orientating yourself against it, deciding what the best response is, and ultimately acting upon it. So to help us do that, as we start to think through how can we go about solving some of the challenges we come up against, as we go through uh, sustain and then into return. We believe that innovation, the skills and tool sets of the innovator is actually a requirement of everyone at the moment. The innovation process is a stick stage process. The first stage, discovering insight, understanding what's really going on and putting your challenge as you currently see it in context, getting insight from your customers, from end users and from other stakeholders who are impacted by the particular challenge. Then moving on quickly to define, okay, so what am I hearing? What is the real opportunity? Is the challenge I thought was the challenge, the real challenge, or is something else going on here? Let me write out the two or three opportunity areas. What is it that I really want to change? How might I go about doing something? Only then do you move into the ideation or brainstorming phase once you've got a really clearly defined opportunity based on insight. And then as we've already talked about, building a scrappy prototype, throwing it up there online, sharing it with customers, like learning from startups, saying, does it work? What doesn't work about it? Testing it out with your key stakeholders, iterating it, changing it, and then implementing it. It's forcing you at times to be very expansive, to discover and think what is the context of which my challenge exists, to then go uh, reductive and say, how can I define the challenge before going very expansive to then say, how can I come up with solutions for it before then prototyping and testing again, going quite reductive before then implementing it. This is may again not be linear, but at least gives you some process to which you can go through to help you solve all the new challenges and new opportunities that you'll be experiencing during COVID-19. So the majority of us uh, said we were in the sustained phase at the moment. So um, Mark has just talked about some of the skills and behaviours and tools that you can use in that phase. Um, and particularly thinking about this, this process that's on the screen right now, what, what are some of the challenges that are emerging for you that you feel like you could maybe apply some creative thinking to? Uh, feel free to uh, type them into the chat box and we, we can explore those a little bit. And of course, remember that uh, on the 2nd of June, uh, we're running a webinar with the Marches Growth Hub on exactly this subject. So we'll be doing a deep dive into this slide in particular and thinking about how you can use creative problem solving to solve challenges both in the sustained phase and in the return phase, but also in your day-to-day -day roles when we're not in the midst of a crisis as well.
So we, I'll share one that came with mm. us as other people start to think about theirs. Um, so we had, uh, we often run as part of our projects, big idea generation days. So we get a working party in a room. We share all the platforms that we define the opportunities under, and we have lots of post-it notes and lots of stimulus and run these really high energy, exciting days, start very expansively and then move into reductive with eight, 10, 12, 15 ideas coming out the end. We can't get together and do that. Mm. So we started to think, how could we do it differently? And is it possible to replicate that online? Um, I went on a couple of training programs. I talked to some other colleagues who run similar sorts of businesses to myself. And I landed on a collaboration tool called Miro. It, at first, scared the living daylights out of me because it's quite technical. But ultimately, yes, I was able to come up and find a pre-made solution that you can do a free trial of. So I tested it with one client, explain what I was doing, and now we'll be implementing that across all of our projects going forward. And we'll give people the option, do you want to have a physical working party meeting when we get out of COVID-19, or should we do it online? Which I believe will mean we'll be able to open our projects much more globally and have different participants. Mm. The output is even better. Some more comments are coming yeah, in out there, um, so, so Heather has talked about how um, this has brought home the, uh, the need to develop more digital services for a digital world. Um, but they don't have money for it, and it's not a strong skill set for the organization. Um, so interestingly, the, um, the point about the, the funding piece is, is, really, uh, is a really good point there. I think you know, what we will probably see is a lot of uh, you know, charity, third sector funding bodies like trust and foundations will, will also have that revelation as well. And potentially, Heather, you could influence them um, to, to help them along towards that point. So one of the, um, one of the brilliant things about this process is um, you know, the, the, the uncovering insights piece is, is often, we often think of it as about the customer, but actually if you think of it in terms of the end user rather than the customer, then you can think, okay, so I could apply this process to potential funders and I could think really creatively about how I'm going to present my case to them and get into their shoes and think about what challenges they want to solve. And, and it might be able to change the way that you do funding applications or funding bids or, you know, um, if, you, if you go to major donors, change the way that you um, interact with them because you've applied a creative process to it and got into the shoes of your, of your customer in that context. Um, and uh, Peter said, how, how can we work in a smarter fashion handling all our projects in an easier way? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the brilliant things about innovation these days is it no longer just applies to products. Or, or, or apps or software. It also applies to business process. And uh, I think you'll absolutely find that this process applies to you. And thinking about who's the end user in that case, it might well be the people in your team and thinking about how you can best serve them and how this process can, how they can both, how they will use the outcome of the process. Um, and Nicola has said, our hospice retail is predominantly bricks and mortar trading. However, we need to research and experiment with online and click and collect. Training required for staff, absolutely. And you know, one of the uh, one of the things that is emerging um, is the blending of digital and high street. So it's about changing the way you imagine what your shop is for potentially, and thinking about as you mentioned, click and collect, but also thinking about are there ways you, you can do something creative in store that involves digital? Is there something you can do on your website that connects to the store? So thinking about the connections that you can create between digital and and bricks and mortar. Um, and using the creative process and particularly using some of the creative tools that we'll dig into on the next webinar um, will help you with that. Um, and Heather commented, this has happened to a certain extent with funders in the crisis. Oh, uh, referring to what I was talking about earlier, I suppose. Uh, we're having a lot more dialogue with them than before. Yeah, that's interesting because they've got more time on their hands maybe. <laughs> So we don't actually, we're 42 minutes in, so I'm yeah, going to yeah. move us along to think about the return phase. Um, Joe said that he would send out the latest white paper on this to you, which is great as well. So you'll get that information. Um, so um, a couple of things that you'll need to start thinking about and questions you'll need to, as you start planning for return and then move into return, because there are two phases to it. One, what does my customer or my end user need now? because there will be different expectations. Their requirements will have changed. We've already seen it with a number of, of the comments in the chat. What do they need? And then what skills and people will I need in my organization in terms of the talent 
and the capability to deliver upon the new expectations and potentially the new business model as a result of the new expectations. So what does my organizational structure need to look like as a result of this? Who do I have where? And what is my pricing model? Do you need to think differently about online and physical pricing models as well? How have you been able to adapt and keep going during the sustain phase and does that have any impact and implication on your pricing model going forward? A couple of skills and behaviors that are vital for this return phase, whether you're planning or actually implementing your return. One, Joe's referred to it already, putting yourself in your customer's shoes, understanding their mindset and trying to anticipate what they will expect of you in the next normal phase. For that, you'll again need to draw upon the innovators toolkit to have real empathy into what's happening in someone else's world and be able to gather insight so you'll be able to turn that into opportunities or challenges that you can solve. It may require you to have some business model innovation, looking at new revenue streams and new ways of generating model uh, man, uh, generating income. Certainly alongside that, if you're looking at talent in the business, moving talent out, bringing new talent in, or looking at restructuring, you'll need to pull upon your HR business partners or HR advice to help work through that in, a, in a motivating and legally responsible way. Once you bring people back together, they've been working as individuals connected through technology. How do you build that sense of collective team, particularly when you may have some people who are physically going back to work, some people who are working from home still, uh, some people in work may be working at different times of day, starting at different times of the day, working on alternative days, who so will have different cohort return working. How do you build that team when it will still be working to some extent disparately? And then also, how do you recognize what's happened? Pay tribute to those who kept the wheels on the bus going, pay tribute to those who kept people engaged and motivated, and mark and respect those who had more difficult experiences, but are able then to move forward into the renew phase. Because what you can't do is just be stuck and frozen in a post-COVID-19 world, constantly dealing with the fallout from COVID-19 and not looking to the future, not <coughs> facing forward and looking at new opportunities for growth. So a couple of questions the leader will need to ask at this time is, how do I collectively build the spirit of my people to face them forward, to think about the future, to set new goals and set new opportunities on the horizon? And we all know that we've built individually huge levels of digital capability personally. How do I take that digital capability, that acceptance of the value of digital communication, and bring that into my business and capitalize upon the great skill set that we've all developed as a result of COVID-19? And a couple of skills and behaviors that I think are vital for this is one, being very goal orientated, looking to the future, not just taking the plans from 2020 that were mothballed and deciding you're going to roll them out in 2021, setting new goals against your new customers and employees' expectations, aligning the team behind those goals and expectations, negotiating with individuals if their job may have changed or your expectations of them may have changed inspiring people as you move them up a gear, changing gear from return into renew and inspiring them to push forward to the future, supported by that digital transformation capability. Now, one way to think about return and renew effectively is to think about the key moments of truth for your employees' experience. We'll probably think, have uh, some knowledge of our end users experience, how they interact with us as a business. But taking a moment to really think about the moments of truth for your employees will help you plan and anticipate any challenges you may have, any concerns they may have, thinking of them as they return back into the workplace or plan to return back into the workplace. What are their expectations? What will have changed? What experience would you like them to have? And how would you like them to feel when they leave that, that interaction, whether it's on their first day, whether it's in their first team meeting, or whether it's in their first one-to-one? -one? What will their expectations be? How will you be able to manage that? And how will you be able to deliver upon that experience in a positive way? I was just interested in the chat here, are there any other moments of truth that you can see for you and your team as you move through return and into renew that you might be able to anticipate as a leader. 
So, you know, for example, that idea of when you run your first team meeting, you may have some people in your organization who are working in the office. You may have some people in your organization who are working remotely from home. You may have some people who are only doing reduced hours. You may have some people who are on redundancy notice and are working out their notice in the organization. How do you run that team meeting in a way that everyone feels engaged equally and you're making sure that you're not just talking to people you're physically in front of and everyone else just watching and observing? One of the key things that I think we have to keep hold of as we move back into work is that idea of inclusion and making sure everyone is equally able to communicate and be listened to during team meetings. So are there any other moments of truth or interactions with your team that you'll need to anticipate and plan for as you start to bring people back to work? See, so, yeah, a key moment of truth um, that's, that's come in is um, the commute. So mm. actually when people are, um, when people are leaving their house for the first time to actually go to their place of work, that's going to be quite a significant mm. moment for people. And your duty of care as an employer doesn't just start the minute they land in reception and you take their temperature. Actually, there might be a duty of care of renting additional space for cars because people now want to drive to work or mm. giving them showers so they, if they're cycling to work or walking to work, they've got facilities. Or providing them with PPE equipment if they're going to be travelling on public transport or offering the opportunity of coming in later in the day so they won't be traveling on such a patch tube or a bus uh, yeah and um so heather says staff are keen to come back to to get back to normal as we talked about on this webinar today um but she's rightly noted that it's going to be a long time before we'll be interacting face to face with our customers and actually it's that moment of realization that's going to become a moment of truth and i think that's a really good point and i know and because you've noticed that and you you can then prepare for that moment of realization and almost manage the cons and manage the the manage that realization perhaps as as, as it unfolds for people and as I, as you start to think through and come up against all of it or come up in in front of all of those potential interactions or new policy moments or whatever they might be I would ask you to try and hold on to the humanity that we've seen exhibited throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Think about the employee experience, what it would feel like for that individual, what fears or concerns they might have, how might they be expressed, and how might you best reassure them with the data set that you currently have and help move them through that moment of truth and out the other side. Because thinking, taking it back to what we call leadership 4.0, the research that we did around how do leaders lead in disrupted times. The way you manage people through return and into renew will create your leadership history. It will absolutely uh, help you to align people and to motivate people to deliver upon the next normal expectation of your customers. If you are conscious about every interaction you have with your employees and are very intentional about the experience that you'd like them to have. So thank you so much for listening to us today. I hope it's been useful and uh, that you're able to understand and perhaps codify a little bit more with the pathway through uncertainty about whether you're in the stabilized phase, in sustain, in return and in renew and how the five practices will help you navigate each of those stages, the questions and the behaviors that you need to answer as you go through each of the stages. Yeah, thank you. It's just to reiterate, Mox, thanks to you all for participating so brilliantly in the webinar. It's always a joy to, um, to hear other people's perspectives. So thank you for sharing. Um, thanks again to the Marches Growth Hub for partnering with us to deliver this webinar and being able to bring this to so many small businesses in Shropshire and beyond. Um, thanks to Anna for organising it. And um, you can see on the screen here that we've got the creative problem solving webinar coming up on the 2nd of June. So that's 11 a.m. Tuesday, the 2nd of June. I'll be sending the, the link out to register for that in the, in the email that I sent following this, along with the various resources that I've noted down that I'm going to send you all afterwards. So thank you all so much for taking part and for joining us and um, have a great week. Stay safe, uh, stay strong. And as, as it is Mental Health Awareness Week, be kind.